am a psychotherapist here in New York City. And this is artist therapy, where I take one artist that I love and try to extract as much as I can from them. The comedian, the writer, the singer, the painter, the poet. Doesn't matter. I want to take as much as I can to help us learn our personal accent. Because usually these characters are pretty singular. They find out how to move uniquely with a certain point of view in the world. As Carl Jung tells us, do not compare, do not measure. No other way is like yours. All other ways deceived and tempt you. You must fulfill the way that is yours. That's how we transform the way our lives move so that we aren't posing and fronting and trying to be somebody else. So we can transform this world through beauty. And so I started this as Springsteen as psychologist, but it quickly became Steinbeck and Springsteen, ping-ponging back and forth, their worlds interweaving. John Steinbeck, one of the greatest American 20th century writers, and Bruce Springsteen, one of our greatest lyricists. And I see so many comparisons in their life. They've taken us from the Stone Pony in Asbury Park to Salinas Valley, from the Jersey Shore to the California coast, Steinbeck over there in California, Springsteen over here in Jersey, and they flip-flop. Springsteen going over to California to live a little bit, Steinbeck coming to live in New York City for a bit, and they both drove all the way across country learning this country, learning the people, trying to understand what makes Americans Americans, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The families, the hometowns, the broken cities, the building cities, the cities breaking down and getting crushed and money leaving those cities and them in shambles and poverty. That's sorrow, but also our best triumphs. And just great, powerful moments in our culture. Like the streets of Philadelphia, that song that Bruce wrote about a man dying from AIDS in a time where it was tough to talk about that. And we needed art to break through where we could just listen to a song and maybe not even know what it is, but still cry a cry. But then think about how we are selfish, that we are critics of things we don't know very well. Love, sorrow, Asbury Park, Jersey, where I grew up, the coast of California, Monterey County. They show us America in its nakedness and when it's all wrapped up in fancy clothes. So if you're like me, you probably have some fire in your belly. Or at least you're trying to get some fire in your belly. You do not want to have regrets in this life. But sometimes it's hard to put your energy towards things. Find that unbelievable store of energy in yourself, as John Steinbeck says. Each of us, and I'm going to use some words from Ernest Becker in his, in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death. He said, each organism, us, lives to be consumed by its own energies. And those that are consumed with the most relentlessness and burn with that brightest flame, seem to serve the purposes of nature best, so far as accomplishing anything on this planet is concerned. Everybody in art uses that language of fire. Even Ernest Becker, talking about psychology, he talks about burning with the brightest flame. If you know anything about Bruce Springsteen, you know that he uses fire and maybe overuses fire in that metaphor. We have to find that fire within us. What does it even mean? We do know that it does not mean mediocrity. We also know that it means don't live with regrets. You got to turn that fire towards something. Let it burn. Let it burn. Being grizzled and gritty, that's what it requires. So I'm going to go into what I think fire means, 
and how we can use our fire. Now, 10, 15 years ago, I was walking in the neighborhood. I live here in the West Village, and there is this collectibles bookstore. It's all tightly uh, curated collectibles, rare books, and it closed down in 2016. So this was years ago. Now, it just reopened up on Perry Street, two block or two apartment buildings from where I used to live. Now, I don't live there anymore, so I, I miss going every every once in a while, but I went in there and, and I was just looking for a book. I had no agenda. Now, Steinbeck's always been my favorite fiction writer. And I walked to the Steinbeck section and I found this book. It was Steinbeck, A Life in Letters. There's 800 pages of letters in here. This is the first edition and it's signed by his third wife. Uh, Steinbeck himself was had some trouble with the ladies. Uh, and he admitted it very, very often. And in this, Elaine Steinbeck writes in, to her friends, Ruth and Paul, in 1986. I was eight years old. In memory of John Steinbeck and our long friendship. And I just started grinding at this book. Specifically, the ages I was <laughs> when he was at that age. So I'm in the 40s now. And there's this cool moment where he says, 46 years old, 1948, more and more, I see that this book is the book. And it has to be done by me. It may be my swan song, but it will be the largest and most important book I have or maybe ever will do. That's why I don't want to slip up on it in any way. I want all my material to be right and correct. Now, he said that well before he started writing this book. It was in his head. The fire was burning. Passion was <laughs> inflamed. Now, he's talking about East of Eden. Now, East of Eden is my favorite John Steinbeck book. And in East of Eden, there's many moments in which he captures what it means to have glory and also to have pain. And I think that is part of the mixture of what fire is. Something down deep that's yelling towards us to acknowledge. Screaming sometimes, sometimes it's a whisper. But when it's a real fire and it's burning, 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 it is a message you've got to listen to. It's something you probably have to do that's pretty important to your life. Bruce says this, you work on a thing that's eating away at you. The most successful artists have something very special eating at them. Something they are trying to sort out that is unsortable. Why do we pick the artists that we love? I think the best artists have some kind of suffering that they've constantly dealt with. And it shows up in their art. It is what I call the authority of those who have suffered. There is command, gravitas, when somebody has suffered well. And that's why I've picked these characters. I've also picked these characters for a couple more reasons. When I went through this book, I see these letters written from all over from Steinbeck. From Kiev, Ukraine, where I lived for a year. From California, where I traveled quite a bit and lived a bit. From Mexico, where I just bought land. This year, I just bought land in Mexico. New York City, just around here, he lived for a little bit while and wrote about New York City. And I take those writings and I cherish them because they're pretty correct about what this city is. He even wrote a letter to a friend about wanting to take his children to Madison Square Garden to see the circus, a thing my dad did in 1986 when I was eight. I remember that day. I remember the smells. We came over from Jersey. We drove in, parking garage. And just a little kid watching the circus in Madison Square Garden, a, a rite of passage here in the East Coast. Special to have these connections with our favorite artists. And Bruce, growing up on the Jersey Shore, I grew up on the Jersey Shore. Living a Jersey life, knowing the characters he was talking about. And so you don't need to dig Steinbeck or Springsteen, but I hope 
that I flesh out some of the passion and some of the psychology that they are bringing to us to learn about ourselves. They speak to our personal struggle. They speak to the corporate and collective struggle that we all have. And to do that well, they had to have the optimal frustration, the necessary suffering in their own life to be led beyond the edge of what was comfortable for them into abysses at times to bring back that manna, that bread, that wine for us so that we could eat well and learn how to walk our journey better, give it a go, and learn our personal accent. The artist and the great artist has to be authenticated by both their sufferings and their joys. And they must be singular. They can't listen to all the noise and try to be something they aren't, as Carl Jung said. They can't be deceived and tempted by other narratives. They can use them, and that's what we're going to do. But to bring out that beauty and transform the world, they've got to be themselves and they have to have fire. So we're going to have a little conversation about what it means to have fire. What is fire? And how do we channel it well and point it at the right things and burn the fucking bridge down that we need to? Or whatever it is in our way. I guess a bridge is actually probably something we need. Maybe we'll build a bridge, we'll burn other shit down so that we get the best out of life. This is the first episode, so we're going to get into it, and hopefully you'll join along and subscribe if you can, so that you know when I put out more episodes. Let's move on. In 1952, Steinbeck finally publishes East of Eden. Now, we know that in 1948, he's building this passion. He's building this fire. It's in him. He needs to write this marathon book, this magnum opus, and he tells his second wife, Gwen, This is the thing I am going to put all of my energy into for the next few years. And it will kill me if I cannot write this thing. This is where I will die. You feel that part of him that's excited, but also pained by this thing inside of him. Now, the book actually spans the life of two families, Trask's and the Hamiltons, just like I am trying to interweave Steinbeck and Springsteen. Steinbeck is taking these two families that are living in the Salinas Valley in California, and he's playing them off of each other, and they they interweave their stories. The families interweave. But there is this theme running through, and it is biblical. It's Old Testament. And if you know anything about Steinbeck and Springsteen, they are not against throwing old-time religion into their work. So we have this Cain and Abel story that Steinbeck is using. First, we have Adam and Charles, two brothers. We have the Cain and we have the Abel. You know, Adam, righteous, good. Charles has that edge and he's got that darkness. And then the sons. We have Aaron good and righteous. We have Cal, misunderstood and rebellious. It's a common theme that's been used throughout, you know, art, but it is a beautiful expression of this, that pain will always be in our lives. I do not care how great your family is, how much work they've done on themselves, how woke they are. Your family has passed down since. Pain dysfunction, whatever you want to call it. And this is what Steinbeck is saying, that can we cut off the sins of the father being passed to the son or the sins of the parents being passed on to the kids? In Darkness on the Edge of Town, an album that was released two months after my birth in 1978, Springsteen says, I wanted my new characters to feel weathered, older, but not broken. The album, The Darkness, is showing that life is hard. Darkness is necessary for light to be seen well. Everything worthwhile is hard. I'll risk what I have to get what I want, is what Bruce was trying to express in that album. But the characters are pretty isolated. So let's see this weaving right now. In the song, 
Adam raised the cane. Oh, there's too many connections to make. In the Bible, Cain slew Abel. These are the lyrics. In East of Eden, he was cast. You're born into this life pain for the sins of somebody else's past. Daddy worked his whole life for nothing but the pain. Now he walks these empty rooms looking for something to blame. You inherit the sins, you inherit the flames. Adam raised the cane. Lost but not forgotten from the dark heart of a dream. Adam raised the cane. Cool book, by the way. Streets of Fire, Bruce Springsteen in the photography of Eric Miola. 1977 to 79. I looked through it often. There's some really badass photos in there. Here's what's part of fire. Pain. We won't escape it. From the day we are born, we are born into a family that's broken. Even the best are broken. They've got weaknesses. And so we look to the artist, as Ernest Becker calls them, the extra magical helpers to create good stories for us to understand our pain. And in that song, Cain and Abel, and in the album, Darkness on the Edge of Town, we learn a little bit about our isolation, but also about that grit inside of us that says, we don't want to live the same life as our parents did, at least the broken parts. We want to grow from them, learn from them. And Steinbeck's saying the same thing, and at the end of his story, He's talking about that, that thing not being passed on, that there is forgiveness and healing. I know the first time I read East of Eden, and the first time I saw a concert live with Bruce, there was something there that said, these characters will help me face my pain. Bruce says the best music is essentially there to provide you something to face the world with, to give you fuel, to give you some kind of weapons to fight the darkness. David Foster Wallace says, in the dark times, the definition of a good art would seem to be art that locates and applies CPR to those elements of what's human and magical that still live and glow despite the time's darkness. See these overlaps? The great artists know that they need to provide fire, uh, CPR. They need to give us something to face the world because darkness will never escape us. And I think if you're probably watching this, you have some darkness in your life or you know it's coming and you've had it. That there's been moments of being neglected and abandoned, abused, forgotten, rejected, or just misunderstood and not knowing yourself well or feeling like an outsider, a bit alien. Or you're just beating the shit out of yourself. Or you have unrealistic expectations of life. We need art for those negative self-assessments. So whether it's sitting down and reading East of Eden for the first time and going, holy shit, this guy gets me. Or whether it's going to a Bruce show for the first time and going, wow, the collective energy here. The compassion and empathy people have sitting next to each other because... There's compassion, empathy coming from the stage. It's a powerful thing. And when great art happens, it transcends age and income and color and background and gender. As Alanda Botten says, it speaks to the movements of our collective soul. That great art will apply that CPR and it will show us how to deal with the intersection of pain, joy, desire, because that is where fire is. It will show us how to get through the dark, but not hate the dark because the dark will actually give us some of our greatest lessons. In the hero's journey, uh, Joseph Campbell says, we need to descend into darkness, into the crooked lanes of our spiritual labyrinth to purify ourselves, to concentrate upon how we will find the transcendent in the darkness, because we will never escape it. So when we are soul troubled, when we are in pain, 
when we are fearful that the bits inside of us that are uniquely ours will never surface and never be seen by the world, that we'll go out with a quiet whimper, we need fire. And part of that fire, it's pain. It's suffering. The art of, artist celebrates not only the light, but the dark. Why do they celebrate it? They celebrate it so that we aren't alone in it. They celebrate our collective experience of working through it. It's meant to dig deep into our psyches and rustle up some truths, some values. So we can be supported by them, so we can know more of who we are. So that is the first component of fire. It is suffering and pain. I hate it. I hate it every day that I have it. But we kind of need it. Can't fully explain why, but we kind of need it. We have these great artists to help us work through it. So let's move on to the second component. In 2013, I was invited to a concert. I was a little apprehensive about going. It wasn't a musician I was into, but I was intrigued. It was right over the river in Newark, and my buddy had started working for this musician. Yes, the musician was Bruce Springsteen. Now, I grew up in New Jersey, and I spent many of my years and summers down the shore, but I never got into Bruce's music. It was around. The music was always around, but I never really paid too much attention to it. It just wasn't my thing. So I went to this concert as a voyeur. I went to be a fly on the wall and watch what happens, and also my buddy now had been working for them, and he said, hey, give you a little backstage tour, introduce you to some of the staff, some of the, the guys that were working behind the scenes and maybe some of the musicians. And so as a music lover, me and my brother went, but it was transformational. There's this term called veriditas. It means greenness, the green of things, photosynthesis, the readiness to receive, veridity, like the green part of yourself coming to the point of being just ripe enough. I was 35 years old and I was ready, I think, for something. <laughs> so we go to the show after we get the, the, the pass and, and we look around. <clears throat> and there was this moment, must have been, you know, Bruce's shows are really long. So it must have been maybe an hour and a half to two hours in. And I'm sitting next to two families, and families in the front, families in the back, generations, from babies to grandparents, all watching Bruce just be Bruce. And the song Wrecking Ball came on. And it had some connection to me about certain parts of New Jersey that the old had left and the new was coming, and that transitional type of experience. And something happened to me in that song in which I went from being a voyeur to a congregant and since have been to about 20 shows. There was pure joy that I experienced. I was ready and tears came. That song seven or eight years ago with generations around me, nationalities around me, different colors of people, although mostly white. <laughs> I was ripe and ready to receive something new in his music, in his words, and in his interviews have helped me from 35 to now 43. There was tears coming down my eyes, but there was joy. Joy is a huge component of what we are talking about with fire. If there is darkness and there is east of Eden, there is also Eden. There's those moments of bliss, eros, sensual elements, the urge for more life, the development of self, of our powers, the shiny and sexy stuff. There is something there for me. It was good. When Bruce says, I wanted my music to be Music of transcendence, that's what I felt. Steinbeck says, I was on my big train of a book. 
when he's talking about East of Eden. My blood bubbles when I think of it. I get a feeling like silent weeping. I think what he's speaking there is about joy. It's not about pain there. But joy can often look so much like pain because the weeping comes and the feeling of warmth and buzziness in our body can almost be like the same type of buzziness when we want to flee something or get away from something. But joy, wherever you think it comes from, God, the universe, just some kind of chemical compound that's playing out in our head, it is when art is smarter than us. It's when art is hard to reduce to technique. And it's when the artist, the zestful part of the artist, convicts us to find the things we appreciate, that we love. Where we go beyond our normal limits and we move with confidence and not given a fuck about a lot of what else is going on. Exuberance, maybe we'd call it. Like, the commingling of energy and hope. And that is what great art does. It is the thrill of hope. That we could face our fears, and face some of the resistances in our life because we are filled with this thing that makes our blood boil. That brings maybe a silent weeping. My favorite part of any book ever. Is chapter 13, first few paragraphs of East of Eden. I'll just read this short part of it. But it is about glory. And when I hear glory, I hear joy. Sometimes a kind of glory lights up in the mind of a man. It happens to nearly everyone. You can feel it growing and preparing like a fuse burning towards dynamite. It's a feeling in the stomach at the light of the nerves of the forearms. The skin tastes the air and every drawn breath is sweet. And then the glory. There's that fuse burning towards dynamite again. It is the fire. I am on a marathon book. It is what I have been practicing to write all my life. Everything else has been training. I wouldn't care if it took all the rest of my life if I got it done. Another letter to a friend from Steinbeck. Here's what I want you to think about. Think about your four favorite loves. Outside of your family, outside of humans, like the things you dig. What are the things you're interested in? To me, there are four in my life that are the, the preeminent. Psychology, music, entertainment, and hosting. I love to host. I love to bring people into my place. You right now. I like to set things up so you see a little thing that you go, oh, that looks cool. That might say something about the human that lives there. Why a buffalo? What's up with that? See, and is that a city back there in the clouds? Why did he have an artist paint him a sea with a city clouded over that you can almost not see it? It's the same thing with the artists we love. They have these components that make them what they are and are their guiding light. Hosting, entertainment, clearly music, and psychology or communication. Those are the four legs of a seat I sit on. And when I am in the right spot in my life, we're speaking about purpose here, I'm utilizing those things. That is the ultimate expression of what makes me me and how I give to the world. And my purpose, the table that is in front of that seat, is I am here to help people understand things about themselves they didn't know they wanted to know. That is my purpose. It took me a long time to figure out that sentence, but I challenge you to do the same. What makes you you, and what do you do best in this world, and what are the intricate components of that? What's the seat you sit on, the stable seat you sit on? 
this is the intersection of those kind of joys being given back to the world. Now we have to move to desire and longing. We are all still searching for Eden or the thought of Eden. That place that is beautiful, perfect, and gives us what we want. Where we could be our true selves fully without the pain, without the heartache. And we are all pursuing that. Maybe for you it's a job, some kind of passion project, another human, a lover, that thing you're shooting for, more money, whatever it is for you. Whether it be a healthy passion or an unhealthy passion, we've got a bunch of them. We are searching for Eden. We want to be back there. What were those characters looking for? Adam was looking for the recognition and love in East of Eden from Kate. But Kate was a prostitute with the darkest heart who didn't give a shit about him, just wanted to use him. But Adam couldn't quit Kate. And his son, Cal, was looking for his love, wanted recognition from dad, value me, understand my uniqueness, understand what makes me tick, dad, so that I could be unleashed. Otherwise, I am just operating with this resistance holding me back. Unleash me. It's the same for Bruce. It's one of the saddest moments in his biography. Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run. It's a pretty awesome read. One evening, my father was giving me a few boxing lessons in the living room. I was flattered, excited by his attention and eager to learn. Things were going well, and then he threw a few open palm punches to my face that landed just a bit too hard. It stung. I wasn't hurt, but a line had been crossed. I knew something was being communicated. We had slipped into the dark nether regions beyond father and son. I sensed what was being said. I was an intruder, a stranger, a competitor in our home, and a fearful disappointment. My heart broke and I crumpled. He walked away in disgust. If you know anything about Bruce, you know that he always wrestled with the relationship with his father. And I think he seems to have forgiven him as his father has passed on. But we are looking for love. We're looking for understanding. And we're hoping that when we get that, it unleashes us to go after, to have the desire and passion to go after the things we want, the purpose the highest expressions, for me, the highest expressions of helping you understand things about yourself that you didn't even know you wanted to know. And in that chair, music, entertainment, psychology, and hosting. This isn't it for me. There's something bigger that I want that I've been working on for seven years, a project I've been working on for seven years that I have not been able to make happen because I haven't got the right people to say yes and give me the money to do it. I don't have the money myself. That keeps me up at night. I remember once listening to Pesh Mode's um, song, Enjoy the Silence. One night, I needed that inspiration for music to keep the passion and the desire inside for this project I've been working on, because often I want to quit it. And I watched a live version of that song at least 25 times. I couldn't get enough. I did not sleep that night. Just the beauty of them performing is keeping me going, keeping that passion alive. Bruce says in the, the lyrics in I'm on Fire, sometimes it's like someone took a knife, baby, edgy and dull, and cut a six-inch valley through the middle of my skull. It's that thing you're working on. That, thing that he talks about that you were trying to figure out inside of yourself. How do you put the pieces together to get what you want? There's something invisible, meaningful, and complicated in our core 
that wants to target something in life and give ourselves to it, to be burnt up, to be exhausted by it. It's glorious and it is painful, joy and pain. But now we got to throw in desire. We got joy and pain that just naturally happen to us. And when desire is there, now we got the fire. Now it is in full blaze. It keeps us alive and going, and it is our lifeblood. But we also know that when we're talking about desire, a dream without suffering is little more than just a fantasy. And so many people, maybe you're one of them, has just been thinking about what they desire and not actually letting the flames burn high enough and thick enough to go out and do it. Desire and fire are not about mediocrity. My feeling is that God or the universe or whatever is pushing us forward here, evolution, digs us too much to let us escape opportunity. It is around us. We just got to look for it and then be bold enough to go after it. Burn, burn, burn. The Latin for vocation is voice. It's weird, right? Our career is our voice expressed. Let your highest truths and values drive you. It's essentially what your vocation is. And maybe this is about your vocation. Maybe it's about finding that thing that you're passionate enough about to pursue. Music and writing will remind you of what is important to you and valuable to you. And it's about pointing that fire at it. The fire metaphor is also about danger. It burns you. You are going to get burnt in this. You're going to be rejected if you go after the thing you love. You're going to be denied. The resistance will come at you over and over and over again. I love the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Because it is about that constant resistance that will come when you are passionate about something and you want to get something done. You're always at the razor's edge between not making your dreams happen and making your dreams happen. And opportunity is the thing you have to look for. And you have to be bold enough to go after it. The Chinese symbol for crisis, which a lot of us are in when we're trying to find the things that we want to go after and then target them is two words, danger and opportunity. That's it. So a good artist will bring us discomfort. Hope, yes, but discomfort too. They are to be admired and feared because they will tell you about your values and then you'll have to do something with them. They are forces to be reckoned with. This is where we go into fight or flight or fight. Flight or fight, <laughs> our desire, and the pain and the joy that are all mixed up that make this thing a, hot, a heavy, heavy fire have to be used. In that same song, I'm on fire, Bruce says, at night I wake up with this sheet soaking wet and a freight train running through the middle of my head. Only you can cool that desire. Or only that thing can cool that desire. For me, it's my project. Something's going to have to break and break for me or that grief's going to have to be really fought for, for me to give that thing up. So let's move towards the conclusion here, but I hope you're thinking about what's important to you, what you value and what artists help you tap into that. I hope that this has been empowering for you, maybe enlightening. It might just be something for me, something to keep me going, to keep my fire burning to keep me hungry and not giving up on my life, giving my life a, a, still a bit of a go, just getting after it. Bruce says, rumble, young musicians, rumble. Open your ears and open your hearts. Don't take yourself too seriously, but take yourself as seriously as death. You've got to take yourself seriously enough to let that fire burn. Let the pain and the joy mix with desire and aim it at something. 
I don't care if you practice on a human and aiming it towards a human and giving them love, but hopefully your purpose will come out of that. And if you have your purpose, take it to the next level. Go beyond where you already are. My favorite psychologist, Carl Jung, says, I have my eye on the central fire. Your vision will become clear only when you can look into your own heart, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakens. Damn, I love Carl Jung. Sharp to the point, we have to do the inner work so it's not just dreamy shit that we're thinking about that we regret years from now. But that we can say we exhausted ourselves as Ernest Becker talks about. We are consumed by the fire in a healthy way, you know? We're not consumed. Uh, If I look to Scripture, old school, Old Testament, we've been talking about it the whole time. It's Moses in the burning bush. That bush is burning, but it does not consume the bush. It is a metaphor for the the heat we need to face the world, but not be burnt to a crisp by it, to use it as fuel. Annie Stavidin Steinbeck says, it might be better for you to come out from under your might-have-beens into the winds of the world. Again, speaking to taking the risk, moving out, He knows full well, as Martin Luther knew, the devil cannot bear singing. The musician, the best musicians put their fire to work. The best artists put their fire to work. They have a strange carelessness. They cross boundaries. They have courage, but not without pain, darkness, joy, glory, desire, longing. If I look at Steinbeck, I think the the legs of the seat that he is sitting on when he wrote East of Eden is his love of writing or communicating himself to the world. His love of nature and the Salinas Valley, that part of California that he knows so well. History, his ability to dig deep into the history of a place and a time and to foresee the future a bit and the complications and personality profiling. I can't describe as just a therapist the powerful way he communicates how humans move in the world and the exactness of all these different characters and how those characters show up in the world. It's very true to what I see in my office. But ultimately, we've got a choice, and this is what the the powerful hook in the book is. Tim Shell, thou mayest, meaning you have the choice. You have the choice. Steinbeck says, I finished my book a week ago. The longest and most difficult work I have ever done. I have put all the things I have wanted to write all my life in it. Having done this, I could do anything I want. His big train book, his marathon book, East of Eden, when he exhausted himself in it, it freed him to do whatever he wanted to do. Not without pain, not without joy, not without desire. I'll end with this. I shared with you my my favorite passage in any book, chapter 13, the beginning of East of Eden. It ends like this. Then a man pours outward a torrent of himself, and yet he is not diminished. It is the mother of all creativity, and it sets each man separate from all other men. The glory. I hope you find that within yourself. Find your fire. So thank you for joining me on this journey, and I'm going to keep on interweaving the stories of Springsteen and Steinbeck and hopefully 
keep sussing out some good content for us to devour and chew on and play with. If you are into this at all, subscribe. I also have other episodes. Just did my Seinfeld as Psychologist. And hit that bell because it'll tell you when I'm putting out new content. Thanks for spending the time. As I always say at the end of these, from here we go everywhere. And everything is yet to be done. Everything, in the words of Rainar Marie Rilke. Have a good one, guys. Bye.